Uh, thank you very much. Uh, look at those figures that were just presented to you. How confronting are those numbers? They are, they are stuck, they're confronting, we must do something about it. So I commend everybody involved in this report. It's an excellent product um, and we need to use this for advocacy. You would be aware of what, you, of what uh, some of the main themes of this conference have been. Uh, people from the Global Fund, Mark Dybel, a lot of the people from the World Bank, uh, myself and others, have been advocating for the way we need to end this epidemic is by focusing our resources much more uh, focused. When you focus the resources where the epidemic lies, or of the most cost-effective approaches. The only region of the world where, that has an increasing epidemic is Eastern Europe and Central Asia. The, the epidemic there is being driven by, uh, by unsafe, injecting equip, uh, unsafe uh, injections. They do not have the, uh, the harm reduction required uh, to minimize their harm. I'm going to provide some, just some complementary data about uh, the situation around the world. Why do we care about harm reduction? Well, we need to put it into context. Should harm reduction take preference over ART? Should it take preference over condom use um, among pregnant women? Uh, should it take uh, preference over some other, other, um, other uh, prevention programs? Look at the data. This is the global data here. The relative risk of HIV compared to the general population is of course higher among the key affected populations. Sex workers, MSM, and people who inject drugs. Among sex workers, they're 13-fold higher uh, uh, risk of getting HIV than the general population. MSM, 13.5-fold greater risk. People who inject drugs, though, 20-fold greater risk. They're the population group with the greatest risk of acquiring and transmitting HIV. Clearly a key population where the majority of funding ought to go. If you want to stop HIV, you need to stop HIV in this key group. Well, what harm reduction programs work? We've got evidence for this. In, with regards to treatment, the WHO has treatment guidelines that the world now follows. We've now got other guidelines. Here, we've got the WHO, UNODC, UNAIDS, together, put together, their a nine component comprehensive package. This package outlines three priority programs. These, these programs have evidence that for working. What works is needle and syringe programs, opioid substitution therapy and antiretroviral therapy. These are the key things that work. Uh, there was a session a, a few days ago I presented there on a, an overview of the cost effectiveness of harm reduction programs. And what I showed there, uh, this is just a broad summary, is that harm reduction interventions are good value for money. Indeed, I'm a health economist. I'm a professor at the University of New South Wales. I do a lot of work with the World Bank and I'm, I'm the, probably the key person who does cost effectiveness of harm reduction and these focused prevention programs for governments around the world. There, I don't just focus on harm reduction because it's not, it's not the priority just to focus on one, one particular program, but you need to put that in context, context. Put it relative to every other program. Should harm reduction be, be funded versus other things? What I find country after country is that harm reduction is the most cost effective. It's more cost effective than other prevention programs, more cost effective than treatment. What I tend to find is that the most important program to fund first, if you want to stop your epidemic, is needle and syringe programs for people who inject drugs. After that, it's opioid substitution therapy, followed by ART and other prevention. Of highest importance is harm reduction, but unfortunately, it is one of the programs that is least funded. $100 to $1,000 invested in harm reduction can save, it can save an infection, save somebody from ever getting in HIV. It's hugely cost effective. Needle syringe programs are strongly cost uh, effective and they've got, they're, they're strongly cost effective. Sometimes they've, they're highly even cost saving. That means you invest in that, in that program because you save people from getting infection, infected, it means the government does not have to pay for the treatment of that person down the line. What that effectively means is they save money in the end. It's though they're investing money to get money back that they don't have to spend later. They're that cost effective. Opioid substitution therapy, very strong evidence for its effectiveness and cost effective when combined with needle and syringe programs. We just heard that the global coverage of these programs are extremely low. Only 10% of people who inject drugs around the world access needle and syringe programs. 8% OST. About 14% access antiretroviral therapy of those with HIV. 
that leaves just a very small overlap of people who have the, the combination of prevention that's really required across these three priority interventions. Well, how much is spent? We've just heard that about $160 million is spent uh, per, per year in low and middle income countries on harm reduction. That's three cents per person per day. That's all. That's all that we think the prevention is worth in this population. That's what the global community is saying. Well, how much is needed? We heard from the investment framework previously. Here, I have conducted some analyses with the World Bank. This is what we've come up with. Well, the World Health Organization has said that we've got a mid-target and a high target. Uh, for a high target, just getting 60% coverage of needle and syringe programs. That's not that high, but that's what we're deeming as high target. To get to that, this is how much money we would require by a different region of the world. What you can see is that we're going to need about $2.7 billion. We just heard previously, about $160 million is spent. We're far from even this mid-target level of coverage. We are so far from the needed levels. There's a large variation in funding across the world. Upper middle income countries are funding the majority, so about 90% of their funding is coming from domestic sources. They're funding it well. Low income countries are reliant on the global fund and other sources. Middle income countries here, the lower middle income countries, they're in a gap. And they're having to transition and they're not able to do it. It's in these middle, these lower middle income countries, that's where we predominantly see them affected by um, injecting drug use and that's, that's where most of the infections are, occur are occurring and that's uh, where the funding is going to be uh, of most concern. Ha uh, harm reduction resources, it does have a major impact. There's evidence after evidence, study after study showing exactly the same thing. For example, here in Vietnam, we showed that with the spending on needle and syringe programs over time, that the epidemic declined. Without that, without that scale up, the entire epidemic would have uh, had this type of trajectory. This is uh, an analysis, a report that came out uh, earlier this year uh, by Difford and the World Bank, um, and I, I, was, I had some involvement in that study. Huge impact due to harm reduction programs. Here again for Indonesia, you can see that uh, currently this is what the trajectory is likely to be. We're estimating that over the next 10 years, incidence is on the rise. Uh, but Indonesia is very much struggling at the moment because the global fund is withdrawing. Uh, bilateral funders are withdrawing from Indonesia. We know the epidemic is being driven by injecting drug use. Without the investment, as funders start to withdraw, we can expect this type of incidence, a very large increase on the increasing epidemic. The priority in Indonesia has been harm reduction. We know that, we've got very strong evidence for that, but the government itself is not willing to fund harm reduction in Indonesia. It has only been funded by international donors. So this is an example of, of the situation we could see in many middle income countries. I'll just skip over this. One final argument I'd like to make is an economic one. Economics drive uh, ministers of finance. The ministers of finance are the ones we need to talk to here. Because they are the ones that need to increase some of the, the investments. We don't need to lobby just for harm reduction because it's competing against other, other programs within HIV and HIV programs are competing against other health priorities. Health priorities are competing against infrastructure, education, other priorities of the country. Put it into context. We need to fund, we need to reduce our HIV epidemic. How do we do that across all of our programs? Well, I can tell you quite clearly, the most important program for any HIV response where there is injecting drug use is that harm reduction is always the most cost effective. Um, I've done systematic reviews, others have done reviews and have always found that to be the case. They're cheap, they're effective, they're cost effective. Put it in the context of broader, broader HIV responses, they're the most cost effective. HIV, funding HIV programs, if you invest now, you'll save more money later on. This is an argument that ministers need to hear. Here this is shown that, uh, this is across all of Asia. An analysis done uh, with uh, a high level panel across Asia and the Pacific with the UNAIDS RST. What we found is that if we invest, if we uh, do nothing now, we continue the status quo, the overall HIV burden year by year is going to continue to increase as you get more people with HIV. However, if we invest qu earlier and quicker 
and uh, more impactful now. We increase our, our investment in HIV, we can stem the epidemic. So with a higher, a higher uh, investment right now, but what we'll see is that that will pay off. We then do not have to pay for as much uh, treatment down the line, the cost will start to decline. Before too long, we're going to end up saving money. The governments will not have to save, uh, spend as much money into the future. And that's a powerful argument that governments can really respond to. So I just, just finished there and just uh, I can highlight, I, I decided to come to this because uh, I've seen study after study, I've been investigating this for years and I, don't, I do not just evaluate harm reduction programs but evaluate all HIV programs. Time after time I always find harm reduction programs are always the most cost effective and where the money should go first. But unfortunately harm reduction programs are very much underfunded with extremely low coverage. So do take this report and advocate with it.